get by It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the same like right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Um, you know, I'm going to introduce today's guest, Wes Matthews, in a second of high-level marketing. But Wes, I always like to mention past episodes that people should check out. And since Wes has started and grown this amazing agency, I figured I'd mention um, John Morris talked about growing his agency to 250 people and then selling it. He's got an amazing story. And then Jonathan Jacobs of Digital Natives talks about how he helps top authors with their book launches. And I found that book launch, uh, what he does there, it was fascinating. And check out there many, many more on inspiredinsider.com. And uh, before I introduce Wes, this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships by helping you run your podcast. And for me, Wes, I'm always looking at the companies I admire, the people I admire, profiling them on my podcast to learn from them and other people can learn from them. And, you know, the number one thing in my life is relationships and just building those relationships and giving in a giving fashion. So if you haven't thought about starting a podcast and you are a business, even before, you know, I was doing this, I've been doing this for over 10 years, Wes, and I've been telling people the whole 10 years, if you have a business, you'd have a podcast period and you guys do websites. I say, Every you would be a you know if, if you didn't have a business and you did not have a website that's absolutely crazy. Not only a bad website. I know you help people actually optimize our website, and we'll talk about that. But I believe that will happen with podcasts in whatever it is three years, five years, ten years. Or like everyone should and will have one, but we'll see. We'll mark. But we'll go back to this conversation and see if I'm right on that. But um, the, I, without further ado, if you have questions, by the way, go to rise25.com. You know, I want to give a big shout out to Todd Tasky, who introduced today's guest. And Todd is a 20 plus year entrepreneur. He helps people develop a successful exit strategy and help them sell their business for maximum value. So check out Todd Tasky and what he's doing there. Um, Wes Matthews is a CEO and founder of High Level Marketing. And Wes, I think you, you like to describe yourself as scrappy, a scrappy entrepreneur, a strong leader who cares about helping businesses grow. Um, and fun fact about Wes is if you're not watching the video, he's obviously got an amazing beard at this point in time, but he's uh, on the board for EO Detroit. He's got four boys. And so you look pretty relaxed having four kids running around who let you like golfing, fishing, and hockey. Uh, so Wes, thanks for joining me. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You know, there's a couple of things I want to dig into. I want to talk about how you balance wife, four kids with business. Um, but first of all, how'd you meet Todd? Randomly. Uh, so through COVID, I, you know, I, I must get maybe no shortage of five to 10 emails a week, people asking me about selling the company, meet this company. And I randomly got a cold email from Todd. I was sitting at my desk, I was bored, I clicked on it. And he looked like uh, Grant Cardone. <laughs> a little bit. And I just got done reading Grant Cardone's book. And I said, ah, all right. Yeah, maybe I'll take a call with this guy. So I replied to the email. He replied right away. And then uh, I had a video call with him. And I was like, I actually like this guy. You know, he's a refreshing guy. He's more of a sales guy at heart. He wasn't like a suit, you know, private equity. And we just had a great conversation. And uh, yeah, I mean, I really wasn't in any opportunity or position to sell at that moment in time. And Todd just kind of serendip serendipitously came in that moment. And yeah, it, it was it's interesting. a chance of Because you get so many people reaching out to you, what was it about that cold email that stuck out? It was you just remember? real brass. Back. Like, it wasn't fancy. It was just like, hey, I'm Todd Tasky. You know, I don't know if you're interested. It was very basic. And, straight you know, to most the of the ones I get are very, yeah, straight to the point. Most of the ones I get are like, we are the largest hedge fund manager and probably and like, it was none of that. It was just raw. And I'm like, all right, I was bored, you know, <laughs> that's good. Um, yeah. I love that. So four kids and a wife with a yeah. budding company. And we'll talk about kind of the transition and growing from 45 people to a hundred people. Talk about how you make sure and weave in family stuff and four kids. 
Yeah. So like the pursuit of entrepreneurship, I've always been big on like, you know, I, I'm never going to work 90, hundred hours a week. Like that just wasn't in my DNA, uh, even pre-kids. Like I got to enjoy life. And so what I do now, I'm, I'm always in a constant, you know, spot of like improving and always constant improvement. But you know, what I try to do is, you know, wake up in the morning, uh, you know, try to get to the gym or work out. Like that hasn't been going great. I'm back on the wagon this week. So that's been good. But uh, you know, 8.30 to 9 to like 5, 5.30, like I'm kind of jamming, like I'm all in the business. And then outside of that, what I try to do is tech off. You know, this thing right here is a blessing and a curse, right? Because I you know anybody can get in contact with you. But I try to go tech off, focus on family until about the time they go to bed. And then, you know, I'm trying to get to bed by 11 every night. So just, you know, again, it's, it's not perfect. It's just kind of what my design looks like. I try to do that as best as possible. Obviously, things come up. But uh, you know, family is important to me, just giving my kids attention. I'm never going to miss one of their games. I'm never going to miss an important event because there's a client issue or a meeting. Uh, very big on that. Yeah, no, I love hearing your strategies. And it sounds like you just have really strict boundaries around that. And, and you, you create those boundaries by maybe just shutting off anything digital after a certain point. Are there any other strategies for, you know, entrepreneurs are like, typically just want to go all the time. And so you seem yeah. very similar to that. So it's not necessarily an easy, maybe it's easier said than done. What are, are there any other strategies you recommend that you found that work for you, even when you have like a big deal coming up and you're like, I need to work on this for tomorrow and whatever it is, any other things that you found help you yeah. not fall off the bandwagon? Yeah. I so there, there's something called uh, EOS, the entrepreneur operating system, which I discovered, mm -hmm. you know, you mentioned I'm a part of EO entrepreneur organization. And uh, that's like a framework for entrepreneurial ran companies because we're all crazy, right? I'm a visionary. I come up with a million ideas and just everything's always chaos with me. So I'm sending emails, I'm getting emails. I'm constantly like, my day used to feel good. I'm like, I did so much. But in reality, this EOS framework really helped me streamline and organize my to do's and uh, really helped me, uh, you know, stay out of the weeds and really stay focused. So again, I've also said, you know, I'm not saving lives. We're in the web and digital marketing space. Obviously stuff happens, comes up, like servers go down, issues happen. But for the most part, I've always been, hey, it can wait till tomorrow and I'm not going to, you know, freak out or stress out about it. Yeah, actually. So I have featured Gino Wickman. So people should check out that episode yes. and Mark Winters of Rocket Fuel. So check out that episode, which is an amazing book talking hey, about. Go ahead. Those, those two books changed my life, honestly. Like I've read a lot of kind I read a lot of audio, listen to a lot of audio books, but those actually created the framework that's allowed me to be what I feel is successful in my personal balanced life. Cause there's no magic pill, right? It's just how you, you know, defining success and what works for you, right? Like I got some guys that, you know, come home at nine and see their kids for 10 minutes and, and that's what they want to do. Like, I'm not here to judge, but for me, that's not what I want to do. So I took the framework, aligned my company, drove the vision and the culture to that. And you know, I think it also helped too in terms of recruiting and, and laying a foundation because people around me know how important that is to me. And that makes them feel really good knowing when their kid has a soccer game or something that I'm not like, you should be at the desk, like hammering projects and writing deals. They, they know that that's where I'm coming from and they really respect that. Yeah. And, you know, I love what I love about the rocket fuel is kind of laying out the visionary integrator so that the crazy, awesome visionary like you it's like, oh, this is really my missing puzzle piece. And so I want to talk about um, how you met your partner and how you decided to partner up. Yeah, yeah. So rewinding back to 2009. So I was always on the sales operations, like the vision drive of the company. Uh, my partner now after we partnered, uh, he's a technology guy. So we kind of met each other at a time where a lot of people would approach him that wanted to go into business because he's like this mastermind technology guy. And he would take on these clients or individuals that would never sell anything or never, nothing would ever come to fruition. And I was personally struggling with finding a, a, a constant software guy that I could count on. So we started doing a little business together. And, you know, one day I finally said, Hey, you know, why don't we just partner go 50, 50, I handle the front of the house, you handle the back of the house and let's just get it done and get after it. And, and that's what we did. And, you know, 11 and a half years later, we just took that simple idea and kind of grew that into where it is today. Talk about the initial 
service and software and offering and then the evolution? Because I'm sure what you started off doing is not what completely what you do now. What was initially and then how did it evolve? So what was attractive to me uh, about my partner at the time, John Bowerman, is he he built his own content management system that websites, so anytime a website would be built, it would be off this proprietary platform. And I love the concept because when customers are on our platform, they can't just jump platforms. You know, there's a lot of work that gets done and then we can like build our own kind of culture around that. So, you know, we started off early on like little simple A, B, and C packages you know, for very little money. And you were like the first couple of years, we were trying to figure this out. So what that's evolved to today is, you know, millions of dollars, millions of hours investing to, to offer this really great high level dashboard that a customer can log in the back end, not even log in, click a button to see how many leads they're getting, what their ROI is, like literally as much data as they can digest into a really simple format. And they can manage and see the success of their online digital marketing campaign right in this really attractive dashboard. So I think that, you know, anytime anybody's spending any money in marketing, you want to know what, you know, what am I getting back for my dollars? And our, our dashboard allows customers to see that quickly, real time, real data, no bullshit behind it. And, uh, you know, they can go in and manage their website and, and pretty much manage their whole marketing initiative right from the back, or we can do it for them. So it's really intuitive. Um, and it's, yeah, it's come a long way. I mean, I look back at some of our notes from 10 years ago and it's just kind of, it's good to reflect back from where you came from. Right. Yeah. When you pick up your head and you're, I always picture someone swimming. If you just swim forward and you look back like, Oh, I, I went further than I thought I did. Um, and so what type of clients were you serving then? And then what type of clients are ideal now? Yeah. Back then it was anybody who would listen and pay us money. Um, but typically we would stay with the small business entrepreneurial ran. I mean, that's really evolved into just, you know, non fortune 500. As long as a customer has an entrepreneurial spirit, um, we're a good partner. So B2C is typically where we like to, to live uh, because we can produce a tremendous amount of leads and opportunities for customers. So roofer, plumber, electrician, like the skilled trade guys, real estate, um, you know, that's our sweet spot. So, yep. As long as there's an entrepreneurial spirit, uh, we tend to work well with any type of customer. So Wes, someone like NY martial arts Academy comes to you, they go, yeah. I need your help. What do you do for yeah. them? So in most cases, you do more than just a website, a, you know, I mean, you do more than yeah, just a website sure. and a dashboard. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, to me, still true to today. I mean, everybody's going to go to your website and check you out, right? So want to make sure the website is an accurate reflection of who you are and who you're trying to portray yourself out there in the world. Um, but then also, you know, the magic question to everybody is like, how many leads are you getting from your web, website today? And most of the time it's like none or the website's not doing anything. Um, I'm not investing in it or I tried to invest in it and it never worked. It's like so a brochure like for a New people, York martial arts. Sort of. Yeah. It's like, look, everybody's different. Like we might do business with 10 to a hundred different karate studios, but we, we spend the time to get to know the customer. Like, what are you trying to accomplish? Like wave a magic wand, you know, define success. You know, if we're able to drive leads, what does that look like? What are people doing? What are they buying? Um, and we start with the end in mind, like how many leads can you handle? What's the process? And then we design out, how do we get there? And then we execute and deliver. And we do that by way of organic optimization, in some cases, paid search media. But you know, most of the, you know, again, early on, a lot of people didn't have a website or a great website or any type of organic strategy because it was 11 and a half years ago today, you know, everybody has it, but it's just, you know, we don't pull on the top page for our main service. Our website was built by our sisters, cousins, brothers, friends, daughter. Like we, we, we now understand the relevancy <laughs> of getting into an agency. And again, most people will, you know, find our work, they'll find a website that we've done and see it's ranked all over the top pages of Google and there's all these leads. They'll find us at the bottom. They'll say, hey, you did X, Y, Z. Can you do that to us? So we just try to help explain the importance and, you know, kind of help soothe, you know, the pain because most people have worked with a company, some marketing company where they weren't happy or they didn't the expectation deliver. wasn't met based on what they were. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So we, um, we speak in ROI. You know, you invest this, this is the outcome that we're going to produce. I love the speak of ROI. That's the key. Um, yeah. So NY Martial Arts Academy, they're like, this all sounds great. 
we have a website humming. We have some organic search humming. We have some possible paid search humming. Um, they can look at things in their dashboard. What does a dashboard look like if you were to describe it? What do they see in there? Yeah, we made it really simple, like almost like a mile per hour gauge. Like this is good. This is not so good. This is bad, you know, based on what our expectations and what we're setting. So it really just gives them raw data of, you know, here's the amount of leads you got. Here's how many calls you received, you know, that kind of, it's, it's really, really simple. And we yeah. took, you know, there's, there's great companies out there that give really high level dashboards with millions of pieces of data, right? Like Google analytics is a great tool, but half the time people log into it and they have no idea what they're looking at. We take like the top three to five things out of that in our own proprietary systems and, and give a high level overview to the customer. So they know how many leads are coming in, how many phone calls, that kind of thing. And what keywords are being clicked on the most. I mean, sometimes creating those simple dashboards are harder though, because you're pulling everything in to give you one kind of thing as opposed to if there's 10 different things. So I would argue a little bit that probably what you created is more difficult than just creating a bunch of piecemeal metrics that someone can't make a decision off of, I imagine. Yeah, I mean, because at the end of the day, I mean, regardless if we're doing organic optimization, I mean, if we're driving leads, the conversations I try to have is at the end of the day, like, do you really care where it comes from? Like, you just want to pay a fee and get the result. So let us do the work and make it very simple for you to identify, you know, where am I at? Do I feel comfortable with what I'm paying? So we have account managers, customer service managers who support all of our customers ongoing that are there to help go through the data with the customers. So you know, the customer's never out there on an island. Every project we sell, every customer we partner with, they have a dedicated resource to help them through that journey. Yeah, that, that's key. I love the companies I work with that I have a some kind of account manager or someone that can help me along. Do you recommend them scheduling an ongoing call with the client or do you just um, like, let's talk about year one, two, three, four and beyond. Um, or do you recommend, you know, just touch base with them every so often? What is your recommendation? If there's an agency out there, they have account managers. What's the, what have you found to be a good sweet spot? Every month, a touch point. Um, because again, our model is reoccurring revenue. Customers paying us every month. I'm not going to go 90 days without having a, a conversation with the customer to let them know how we're working for them, how we're showing up, the work that we're doing. Um, if that's not possible, I would say at least every 90 days. I mean, you can do a lot through automation and email. But again, you know, having the conversation, talking about even, you know, one thing that I think we missed early on as a company that if I could go back and change was, you know, we were always very protective of the ball. So like customer buys this package, we spent so much time really trying to protect and fight for that. And we lost a lot of opportunity to talk about the upsell or like what's next. And I kind of learned that a few years after on, you know, all the calls don't have to be about this is what you're paying for. And this is what you're getting. It's what the hell's going on in the world? Like, what are our other customers doing? Like, what are, our, what, what is that other idea that we can give, you know? So we just said, Hey, if we can identify and have that single point of contact to build that relationship, you know, some people are like, what are you calling me for? Or, you know, I thought we're doing our 90 day review. So we just let the, the CSM manager kind of set that cadence to say, to say, Hey, like we want to have at least one deep, meaningful, meaningful conversation every 90 days to go through the data, to make sure we're on the same page. And I think with our retention rate being above 88%, I think that's uh, it, it's working pretty well. Yeah. I love that Wes. Actually. It's like, it's not just a call. It's almost like an insight call because you can see you have a different perspective. You see across many clients, what's working, not just what that one industry or person is doing. So I love that. What else, what other discoveries have you made throughout? Like that was one like, oh, we should be talking about other stuff, insights, what all other products and services we have. What else did you discover that you added in to the system? You know, I think, you know, from where we started to where we're at today, um, it's just, you know, keeping your ear to the street and really asking questions like, you know, what is the customer going through? I think COVID really gave us a good opportunity to have, you know, even deeper, meaningful conversations because I think that where we can come in as value add, it's, yeah, we're offering web, we're offering SEO services, but where I think we started to like really level up is an understanding the customer's like sales journey, because 
my, my old take on the business was my job is to lead the horse to water, not make them drink. Like we're there to drive leads. But what I learned was, you know, we might drive a ton of leads, but if the customer's not closing those leads, they won't pay us. Or they say, we're not getting a good response yet. We didn't listen to their calls. We didn't coach or educate them. So we started to put call tracking numbers, started walking them through and listening to their calls and giving them insight and feedback to say, well, no shit, this is why you're not getting any business because nobody answered the phone. You know, <laughs> and, and right. just like, little, like little things yeah. think businesses have buttoned up, they, they, they don't. So I think us going the extra mile and saying like, let's walk this through to help you close more, which ultimately benefited us. And, you know, at a time early on, we, we just didn't realize we're like, no, we're, we're websites, we're SEO, we're not going to get involved with that. And I wish I would have done that early on. Yeah, that makes sense. Because you were like, well, we aren't getting results. And you're thinking, we just drove you 100 leads this month. How are you not getting results? Right. Um, what are some of the mistakes you've seen companies make right. in those sales conversations as you're listening in? I mean, yeah, one is like, one obvious like one the is going to the owner, not operator. answering the phone is one obvious one, right? But beyond that, like their follow up process, like I think when a lead comes in, like you got to get back to them right away. I mean, I heard calls, I sat in a couple and you know, there's a tree service company and the guys like literally one shoulder, like chainsawing a tree down, like, you know, it, it's just not going to work. You know, I, I think it's, it's having that system and process set up um, because again, like we're, you know, I'm 39. I, the, the internet pretty much started when I came out of high school in terms of popularity. Like peep, if you're a tree service company and somebody contacts you, you have like five minutes to call them back or they're going to go to the next guy and they're going to be booked and you're not going to schedule that appointment. So you've got to be ready and you've got to have a process for that. And if you're the owner operator, like there's calling, there's call answering services and it's just having those deeper conversations um, with the customer to get them to think differently. So that's, that's really what I tell everybody. It's like, if you can get the, the customer to think differently and give them new ideas and how to create efficiencies around their business. Um, again, I mean, I, I'm sure there's customers that just pay us maybe not so much for the SEO services, but just because we're like a really good consultant and we have a lot of good ideas and we're like a, a really good partner for them. Totally. Just that added value. And, and that's what differentiates you know, companies from all the other companies because they go that extra mile, they map everything yeah. out. Um, talk about general filter for a second and what happened there. So that was a client early on. Um, so my partner and I, you know, we, we spent a lot of time doing like small deals uh, in the company, like a couple hundred bucks a month. And we had a great process. And I think they, they hit our, our lead form and I had the meeting with them and uh, they wanted a big project. So like at the time I was super anxious. My partner like you know, threw on our nicest shirt and we're ready to go into this meeting and, and really wow them. Like we didn't have any big customers in our, in our, in our portfolio. So I thought the meeting went great. It was like with their board. So everybody's really, you know, stiff in the room and I have a conversation. It's like up us against five companies and we do our thing. And my partner and I are ping pong and probably fumbling all over. And uh, I think we had another follow up meeting to that. And I, I see my partner one day and he's like, I got some bad news. I go, yeah, what's that? He goes, general filters called and they decided to go with the other guys. I'm like, no way. I'm like, the lady's name, uh, she's, they're so a great client of ours. Uh, her name is Paige. I'm like, Paige loved me. These guys love me. Like, I, 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 I don't accept that. I do not accept that. I said, I'm calling her right now. And my partner's like, no, they said no. I'm like, no, like I'm calling them. So I pick up the phone and I call her and I'm like, Paige, like what's, what's going on? Like, I, I can't believe, like, tell me what I did wrong. Like it, it hurt, you know, and I, it was this close. It was a huge deal for us, like huge, like life-changing deal. And she goes, Wes, I really liked you guys, but the one thing that the partners were stuck on is, you know, there was an invoicing system in your technology that you guys don't have, that the other company has, and that's why we went with them. Everything else we love. And I said, Paige, I'm really sorry that I didn't highlight our invoicing system to you. I guess I missed that in the meeting. We absolutely have an invoicing system, and I'd love to share it with you because I'd love you to reconsider because this is going to be a great partnership. She goes, Oh my God, Wes, like, I didn't know you had an invoicing system. And if you guys have the invoicing system and can come out and show us, we'll absolutely do business with you. I said, perfect. Friday, three o'clock, we're going to come out there, I hang up the phone. I call my partner. I said, Hey, John, what are you doing? He goes, uh, like having dinner with my family. What? I go, 
you think you can get an invoicing system built in 48 hours? And he's like, yep, let's do it. So we did it, built it, delivered on Friday and closed them. And, you know, I, I love that story and I love reflecting on it because that was how scrappy we were. And as entrepreneurs, like you got to just, you can't take no for an answer. And, you know, we went after it. And I think that was the catalyst of like our partnership and how we just sort of rolled forward into the future. It was, it I was going to say, for us. Wes, it's a good thing you have a technical co-founder <laughs> in that situation. I would screwed because, yeah, I would have been completely screwed. But it was nice because like we had that much confidence in each other and, you know, it was a big win. And, you know, at the time, you know, we're doing a deals for a couple thousand a year. This was like a twenty, thirty thousand dollar deal. Like at the time it was like, this is big, you know, so it was, it was great. Great lesson. I love that. Um, fast forward to larger real estate company. And what do you do okay. there? So ironically, I was pulled into a, a meeting and somebody's like, hey, can you go to this meeting? It's a really large opportunity. I'm like, yeah, for sure. And, you know, it was a referral from an existing employee and we go there and, you know, the conversation's going, okay, it's not great. So the individual I was with, you know, he and the, the individual are across the table going back and forth and she's kind of grinding us. And it's just a typical sales meeting, like, what are you going to do for us? And I just don't sell that way. I'm like, how do we partner? And, you know, long story short. So anyway, it's a collaborative a effort, gal. a collaboration yeah, for sure. Like, yeah. so there's a young gal that's kind of, you know, she was listening the whole time and she was really nervous. I could tell. So as they're kind of getting in the weeds and like arguing and doing whatever, I kind of turned to her. I'm like, Oh, so, you know, just having a conversation, right. I'm nice to everybody. Like I'm just genuinely curious and having conversations. I can't tell you what we talked about, but I remember like she was an intern and I'm just like, Oh yeah. Like talking about digital marketing or whatever we were talking about. Okay. So fast forward three weeks or what have you. And my partner goes, Hey, do you remember that meeting you were at? Like we closed, we closed this big deal, huge deal. He goes, do you remember that meeting you were at? And I go, yeah. He goes, do you remember talking to that girl? And I'm like, Oh shit. Like, did I say something? Like, <laughs> like, I, I don't know what's have to come out of my mouth. Like I started questioning everything. He goes, that was the CEO's daughter. And she told her dad after that meeting that you were the only person out of all the five companies that came in there that acknowledged her, talked to her, and you actually genuinely gave a shit. And there was five other companies that came in there and they ended up choosing us uh, to do business with them. And I think that was a good testament because that's just who we are, right? And, and what we do. And that, that was a good one that felt pretty good because it wasn't, it was authentic. And that's just how, you know, how I am and how we operate as an organization. And they've been a great partner ever since. And we've done a lot for them and they've done a lot for us. So yeah, that was really great. I love that. I love that story. I love this story because, and I love your approach of collaboration and it really relationships first, you know, um, and how you can help no matter, even if that's not what you do, it's like, Oh, we'll, you know, yeah. understand your whole sales journey and understand what you're doing on the calls just because that will help you. And that will help us do a better job. It will help them ultimately, even though maybe you're not technically on the hook for it with whatever contract you have in place with them. So I love that. Yeah. And for me, you know, and for me, it's, um, you know, even if we can not help you, what, what oftentimes what happens, like, I want to tell you that right away but I also need the context of what you need if you want me to help you find a solution for you. So half the time, like, you know, I'm, I, I want to disqualify somebody as fast as I want to qualify them to say, Hey, I might know somebody. And, you know, we're very transparent with what we do and like, Hey, we're eager to help and we want to help. But at the same time, we know what we're good at and, and we pass on what we're not good at. Right. And that's a big thing probably too early on. Like we used to take on anything and everything. Now today, fast forward 11 and a half years, we've gotten smarter that, you know, just because there's big numbers tied to it doesn't mean it's the best, uh, you know, the best opportunity just because there's a lot of zeros to it. So we're very uh, particular. We're very conscious of who we uh, do business with. And, that, and that's a great spot to be in um, as a business. Wes, there's two transition points I'd love for you to chat about, which is one, when you transition from 45 people to 100. Um, what was the kind of inception of that? What happened there? that created that? And then how was that transition of all um, more than doubling staff? So still going through it right now. Um, <laughs> the one. It's fresh. Yeah. So the catalyst there is, you know, COVID happened 
happened. Uh, you know, my goal and vision for high level marketing from the day I started it was I had this mental model of being a hundred million dollar valuation company. And, um, you know, we've had great success with HLM up until a point, but, you know, I kind of had some self-reflecting moments and, and asking myself, like, you know, change or change, like you, you can't do the same thing and expect a different result. And we've, you know, we went through some great growth as an organization. Year over year, we're growing, not growing quite to the speed I wanted to. So at the end of 2020, we did about $6.5 million of, of actual revenue. Um, that's not like third party costs or Google costs. Um, you know, and I kind of had to look in the mirror and say, like, how do we really grow and scale? Um, because something's just not right. And I, Todd Tasky calls me out of the blue again. Selling has always been in the back of my mind. I knew it would happen at some point. Just met Todd Tasky and he goes, Hey, you know, because I, he's asked me, like, Hey, do you want to sell your company? And I gave him this crazy number and said, I'll sell it to you for this. Don't even contact me. Right. Cause I'm not in the headspace to sell. Well, I had my strategic meeting at the uh, last quarter of last year and a lot of things I identified or we identified as a group that I knew we needed to go in and fix was going to cost probably about a million and a half in revenue. And we got to hire some key people. And to be honest with you, I'm just like, I'm looking uphill at this battle of like, do, do I have it in me? Like I just great lifestyle business. We spit off a lot of cash. Like it's a great business, but I'm like, comfortable is not where I flourish. Like I need to be uncomfortable in chaos. I know it sounds crazy, but like when things are comfortable, I start to look left and right. Cause I'm, I'm scared. Like, I, I just don't operate well. So Todd calls me and says, I don't have an agenda. He had an agenda. He just didn't tell me. He, had an agenda. <laughs> he goes, there's a guy in Alabama. You got to meet him. Like, I don't care what happens. Just have a conversation with them. So we hook up in about a week and a half to a zoom call. You know, it's nice to talk to other agency owners that have about the same amount of employees and revenue and you know, what have you. Cause look, it's lonely, right? Like it's lonely being the CEO and an entrepreneur of a company. Like everybody shakes their head. Yes. I mean, it's just, it's a different thing, right? Like, so having a conversation with him, like the top three things that were eating me inside, he had solutions for that they've been through and they solved the problem two years ago. And some of the challenges that they had is they didn't, they have a great CEO and a great COO and they have a phenomenal team. Um, what they didn't have is they didn't have a, a Wes, which is a chief revenue officer guy really driving sales. And they didn't have a chief technology officer. So mm -hmm. here we are, Wes and John, CEO, who has, you know, stripped me down to my bones. I'm a sales guy. Like I'm a relationship guy. I, you know, I won the title of CEO because nobody around me was going to take it. And as an entrepreneur, that just happened. Right. And, um, you know, I kind of had to do some soul searching to say, what's next? Like I'm 39. I have this goal and this vision, you know, we're coming out of COVID. So it felt at a time in the company that if I didn't make drastic change, we were going to start to decline um, because resource sharing. I mean, there's just a lot of things where I knew the foundation was going to start to crack and how was I going to patch it? And so this opportunity came up and I started having conversations. So now the conversation turned into more around, hmm, I could actually partner with these guys and also now have a stake of a new company, you know, and, and I mean, I'm, we could take this conversation in so many different directions, but for me, I always start with the end in mind. And, you know, one of my goal was to be 100% debt free personally, um, no fiduciary responsibility left in the business at some point, I just didn't know when that was going to happen. So I felt that the ultimate goal was I wanted to protect the team. So my team had to stay intact. I still want to add contributing and be a high level value for the organization. And this transformation would allow me to sit in my sweet spot and not be in the weeds and, and just do stuff that I'm not, you know, just that I like, nor am I probably good at, you know, you mentioned visionary and integrator, like I'm not an integrator. I'm a wannabe integrator. I don't want to be an integrator. Um, so everything just felt right. And so what they were lacking, we filled the void and vice versa. And we just kicked off that conversation in about five, four months. Uh, we got the deal done uh, end of February. And you know, we are now rolled up into one company. The name of that company is Bell Media out of Alabama. And we are assuming and we took on and maintained the name and just went through a rebrand of high level marketing. Um, so that was kind of cool, uh, retaining our name and now growing under this umbrella and cultures aligned and products aligned. We took all of our products, mashed them together. 
And uh, yeah, so collectively we have about a hundred employees, uh, you know, over 1500 clients, you know, we're gonna do $18 million of revenue this year. Um, you know, again, it's just the, the challenges now are, are different. It's, it's a bigger organization going from 45 to hundred, you know, everybody in Michigan and HLM, old HLM is still digital. You know, everybody's dialing into Zoom. We now have offices, two different offices in Alabama, one in Nashville, satellite office in Houston. So it's just the meeting tempo, the cadence. And the great thing about these guys is they really respected my passion for EOS. And we've adopted the EOS platform into the new organization. We've been operating from it. So that's been fantastic because I vowed to myself, I will never do anything in life business-wise that isn't EOS related because of how it just, I mean, as an entrepreneur, it's, it's a fix, man. I mean, it's a prescription drug for the entrepreneurs. It works. We'll have to send that to Gino Wickman, Wes, and have him hear that. Um, did you hire an EOS implementer when you, when you decided to implement it or did you just go at it yourself? Yeah. Yeah. So early on we hired an implementer and we did the 90 day session, like every, every EOS implementer, I don't know if they still do this. They do like the first 90 session thing. Well, we went through that twice and my beef was they weren't intimate with the business and they wouldn't weigh in on problem solving. And I didn't like that. I didn't need somebody there to kind of like babysit. I needed somebody to help us orchestrate. So I actually took and asked my top project manager at the time, who's my first hire, who's still with us today. I said, Hey, I'm sick of client work. She's getting burnt out. She was on for like six, seven years. I said, what if I pluck you out of that, read this book and implement this in the company and take a year to do it. And I won't bug you. She's like, okay. So we got the whole company. You like the, I in. won't bug she you part less, right? Yeah. Yeah, you sold. <laughs> yep. So, you know, I kind of used her as the implementer until we got the whole company bought in because it was a, you know, 12 to 24 month kind of culture buy in. And uh, yeah, it just sort of evolved and how our meetings evolved and the, and the vision and the three year like we've never hired a an EOS because, you know, I made my leadership read the books. I've been around it for so long and everybody's so comfortable with it. So and I think now as we transition to larger co at some point, once we get through some of these integrations, I'm, I'm thinking about bringing in a high level, you know, maybe even Gino or somebody to come in and give us a refresher or give us some new ideas. Um, what did the yeah. transition look like for you in the, for you now? And, and what is your new role? So my new role uh, by title is chief revenue officer. So the transition has been a little, difficult in terms of, you know, you go from being end all be all right to now there's many other kids in the, in the sandbox you got to play with. And, you know, so it's been different. It's been a challenge, but you know, right now, uh, you know, we all talked openly about, for me, I have the hardest uh, transition because the CEO there is staying CEO, the COO staying COO and my partner staying CTO. I have the biggest transition of saying, Hey, I was the CEO and I'm, I'm moving over. But I think what's happening is I'm, I'm really babysitting, helping sales team transition. Like today, you know, we're moving into a new Salesforce instance. So we're changing little processes. I'm reaching out to the old team, uh, participating in all the leadership meetings. So I will say personally for me right now, it's a little, it's a little weird, but I also feel like it's new. I'm just trying to meet everybody. And then we're, I'm starting to scope out like, you know, what, what am I going to do when I grow up and how am I going to add value? And I know, and I can feel where that value is going to be. Um, and yeah, it, it's kind of right on track, but it's just going to take a little bit of time to kind of get my bearings and just feel okay with, with what happened. It seems like Wes though, you're going to be doing what you ultimately love to do more of the time. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a relationship guy. I'm a, you know, ask Wes to do it. Right. I remember as a kid, like, you know, we may or may not had people buy us beer at a certain age. Right. But somebody had to go to that person and say, Hey, will you buy us? Like I was that guy. Like I have no fear. And I think that, you know, the passion, the experience, the, you know, just the, the relationship side of it and understanding business and how entrepreneurs think, I think that's where I can bridge the gap and solidify some really large relationships. And I think that, you know, again, I, I'm so accustomed to being heads down and, and making sure the team's good. So, you know, right now it's just that little bit difficult to like, it's okay. 
like we have people who are taking care of that and they're doing a really phenomenal job at it. So yeah, it's given me a lot of more opportunity to do podcasts like this. I had another one earlier. I had a really great opportunity with another agency out of Arizona to talk about a potential larger thing that we're working on. So like it, 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 it feels liberating, you know, it's just, uh, it's going to take a minute to get used to. So I'm curious, um, before we hit record, you said you took you a little untraditional route. Um, what, what did you want to do when you grew up, when you were younger? Yeah, I still haven't figured that out. You know, I, I think that's been the question. Um, you know, I, I always, I, when I was 20, I worked for a bank and I wrote loans and I was doing mortgages. And I remember at the time sitting here, like I'm in my twenties and I'm man, you know, a mortgage I felt at the time was the biggest financial decision for somebody. And here I am just young, no real experience. Right. And I'm doing somebody's mortgage. Like who's going to take me serious? Like, I just don't want to do this. And I remember tech and like starting to get involved with web. Um, so like leading up to that though, the unconventional route, like I just, school wasn't my thing. Like I just basically skated through high school. Um, you know, it took me several years to get through community college for my two year degree. I think it was like six years. It just wasn't my thing. And I just knew deep down that at some level I was going to do my own thing. I didn't know what it was. I remember early on, I, I started dishwashing when I was 13. And how I got a job is I whipped out the yellow pages and I opened it up and I called the first restaurant I saw cold call and I got the job. I was a dishwasher. And I remember my mom telling me, why do you want to work right now? You're going to have the rest of your life to work. And I was like, I'm not going to work the rest of my life. Like, that's the difference. Like I'm not, you know, my dad kind of worked till he was in his late sixties and 44 years at a company that's phenomenal. But I always had this different view of the world on, you know, if everybody's going this way, I'm sort of like, I'm going to go that way. And, you know, I, I don't, there was no like burning passion, but what ended up happening, what I felt was, you know, I love small businesses. I love meeting people and I love adding, like, it's really, it was interesting to me at the time to add value in tech or web, because that's like the unknown territory. So I was kind of like that even keel, great resource. And then even now, as I have conversations and as those evolve, like, I love meeting just entrepreneurs and understanding their passion and you know, helping them out, you know, that's, yeah. that's, that's kind of where things ended up. Wes, um, I have one last question. And first of all, thank you. Thanks for sharing your lessons learned some of the, the challenges discoveries along the way. It's been, it's been great. And yeah. um, before I ask it, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you any mentors um, and it could be distant mentors. It could be actual mentors. Like you mentioned the Gino Wickman. So it could be mentors, meaning books or people, but before we go into that, I want to point people towards highlevelmarketing.com. Um, what other places online should we point people towards to find out more about you and, and maybe the, the, the uh, brand, you know, the, the rebranded company? Um, where else should we point people towards? Yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, but most of the stuff is, is out there on highlevelmarketing.com. Okay. You know, I, I've done a poor job of, you know, pushing content and doing things I should have started years ago. And that's something I'm going to start doing now. But, uh, you know, the high level marketing.com has quite a bit of information. Um, you asked about mentors, like had a lot of mentors along the way, one by the name of Josh Linkner. Um, you know, he was, I've interviewed mentor. Josh. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, Josh actually uh, has done a lot for me personally on the business side. Um, he introduced me to EO. So I joined EO entrepreneur organization. You know, that was a game changer for me. You know, as soon as my company did a a little over a million dollars in revenue. I was able to qualify to get in. And, you know, that was a, one of the best decisions I've ever made to be around a group of like-minded entrepreneurs that are, you know, getting after it like yourself to, to, to have that safe group that you can ask questions and learn from experience. Um, you know, I highly encourage and push anybody I can towards that organization. Um, and I've been on the board ever since because I'm so passionate and, you know, I'll, I'll recommend things I'm passionate about. So any other people within the EO ecosystem that you want to give a shout out to Josh? I mean, found it. If people don't know, they could check out the interview. He started ePrize and it's just grown tremendously like a staple in the try. I have friends who still work there. Wes, uh, shout out yeah, to Lindsay Madden. Many of, yeah. yeah. Many iterations of name. I think they're hello world now. Okay. You know, hello world. And, yeah. 
Yeah, so Josh exited from that company and now is a, you know, very talented speaker, just launched a new book, you know, big little break, big little breakthroughs. Um, yeah, I mean, I think EO as a whole, you know, I can't really say one or two people. I mean, it's really been a combination of just, you know, I think as an entrepreneur, as a human being, you pick up little things along the way. And, you know, my mom used to say, hey, you, you know, be careful who you hang out with. You're going to turn into them. And I'm really glad I hang out with people in EO because those are people who I want to, you know, be more like. So that's been a, a really big uh, contributing factor to the success of, you know, me personally, for my family and, and the business. Wes, I'm mean, the first one to thank you. Everyone check out highlevelmarketing.com. Check out more episodes of inspiredinsider.com. And thanks everyone for listening. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.